recording. Excellent. So um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on. In this area, it's the Yagra and the Turrbal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any other elders who are here tonight. I'd also like to um, mention that because we're going out to lots of different areas around Australia, we're going out to lots of different Aboriginal lands around Australia, and I'd like to pay respects to elders from the land that you are joining us from as well. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. So tonight, um, it is my great pleasure to hand over to Anne Tiernan, who has been a regular host at Avid Reader um, and is a leading Australian scholar in public policy with over a decade of prior experience in public administration and consultancy. Her career spans higher education, federal and state government, consultancy and teaching. Anne is respected for her independent research-informed analysis and commentary on national politics, public administration and public policy. Now Managing Director of Mission-led consultancy firm Constellation Impact Advisory and consults regularly to organisations committed to purpose and positive impact. Her work has been published in Australia and internationally, including the Oxford Handbook of Australian Politics, co-edited with Professor Jenny Lewis, and the recent Griffith Review, Five Things to Care About online series. She has many, many other titles out there. It is well worth a Google and reading some of Anne's work. So um, without further ado, everybody welcome Anne Tiernan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, um, very much. Uh, welcome uh, to this special event this evening with Richard Dennis to discuss his, uh, his book, Big, The Role of the State in the Modern Economy, um, a new title in Monash University Publishing's In the National Interest Series. Um, it was kind of Chrissy to introduce me and Tiernan, uh, as she said, as she said. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, and all First Peoples who are, uh, are tuning in tonight. Um, our guest tonight is Richard Dennis, who just made it, <laughs> which is great, from Canberra today. Yes, through the horrendous traffic that Brisbane people can never cope with when it rains. Um, now, Richard, is Chief Economist at the Australia Institute. And I think as many of you assembled here tonight and online know, he is really renowned for his ability to really clearly explain complicated economic ideas and to develop new creative solutions. A former Associate Professor, and they're all getting out of academia, aren't they, uh, Richard, of the Crawford School of Economics and Government at the ANU. Uh, Richard worked as Chief of Staff for the then leader of the Australian Democrats, Senator Natasha stott Despoja, and as a strategy advisor to the um, then leader of the Australian Greens, Senator Bob Brown, as well as working as a consultant, a company director and strategy advisor. Um, he is an extraordinarily prolific writer, uh, and many of you will be familiar with his contributions to The Guardian, The Australian Financial Review, The Saturday Paper and The Monthly. But he's written and co-written uh, six books, including the best-selling Affluenza, When Too Much Is Never Enough, and Econobabble, How to uh, Decode Political Spin and Economic Nonsense, and that is a you know vast territory. <laughs> and now this new book, big the role of the state in the modern economy richard it's so good to have you uh, here at avid reader Thank and you. congratulations on the new book thanks now um monash university presses in the national interest series has published a number of really provocative and timely books small books but provocative and they've assembled a really interesting range of, of writers and many of these titles are, are focused in interesting ways on uh, the crisis afflicting australia's democracy um, and the extent you know political institutions that seem increasingly uh, unsuited to their task um and and i think people will find this very interesting uh in this book um towards the end of big uh, you argue that our democratic institutions, just like the economy, need continuous care, maintenance, and from time to time reform. Yet unlike the economy, we barely even talk about the health of our democratic institutions, culture or outcomes, except to note that they are already weakening. Mm. Can you tell, uh, unpack that a bit for us, please, Richard? I'm really interested in, in your motivation and, and how you read that and maybe how it fits in the, this broader series. Yeah, I oh, thank you. Um, so that's my favourite part of the essay. And, you know, it's like when you write something, like you, you've got this conclusion coming up, but you have to write, you've kind of got to hack through all the thickets before you can get there. Really, it was the democratic stuff that I wanted to write about. But, you know, before you can write about the solution, you've got to write about all the problems and then you run out of bloody words. So, uh, so, yeah, so the end of the book really basically makes, I think, a simple but important point, and that is that, 
for decades, my whole adult life, we've had this banal conversation about the need to reform the economy. And if we don't reform, we'll fall behind. Like it's always about kind of crisis and lack and insecurity. And if we don't permanently keep our eye on the economy, we can talk about what the hell that means, you know, bad things will happen. But what about our democracy? Like don't, doesn't that need at least a bit of tinkering? Doesn't it need some care and maintenance at a bare minimum? I actually think it needs a lot more than that. So, so yeah, so I actually think you know, I'm an economist. That's, that's my thing. But I'm a citizen and I'm a close observer of politics. And I, I think there's no doubt that in Australia and the US and plenty of Western countries, democracy is under strain. But really, I guess what I'm arguing in the book is that this strain is self-inflicted. We've spent 30 years, my whole adult life, telling young people that government is crap, that politicians are corrupt, that everything government touches is inefficient and wasteful, and that it doesn't matter who you vote for. It'll all be crap. So you might as well just privatise it and let someone rip you off because, let's face it, it's never going to work. You know what? We've convinced young people of that. Like, well done, whoever's plan that was. Young people around the world don't think who they vote for matters. They don't think democracy's that flash because they've never heard anyone stand up for it. And, and I happen to think it's pretty good. And I don't, you know, we can talk about this. I don't go in for any of this nonsense that Twitter broke it, you know, or social media broke it. We broke it. <laughs> we, you know, and, and in breaking it, what did we do? If, if we make people have no faith in government, then it's a lot easier to rip us off. You know, we don't, yeah, so, so big picture, I think it's not an accident our democracy and our democratic structures are under strain. I think they got put under strain by people that didn't want them to be strong and powerful. And now we're really, look at the US, we're really reaping a bit of harvest. And economists are, you know, increasingly, like political scientists and others have been for a long time, actually quite concerned about the state of the institutional capacity, uh, you know, for reform, for deliberate, for deliberation, for uh, consideration. And you make, you know, I mean, throughout the book, and I was very struck by this, it's only short, um, but you... Very you, short. Yeah, no, but, but it, it packs a lot uh, into it. And like so much of your work, it contains some really vivid and memorable turns of phrase that, you know, I kind of laugh out loud uh, funny for when you get a chance to read it. But, but I want to, and I will ask you to comment on some of those, but but you open this essay, Richard, by, by, by arguing that Australia's public sector isn't big enough to meet the challenges of the 21st century. It's not good enough to meet the expectations of the Australian people or well-governed enough to cope with the inevitable expansion heading in this way. And you go on to say that this is a real problem because Australia can't keep pace with its allies, its rivals, or the challenges that it faces. And that's pretty uh, topical in the last fortnight and particularly today, I guess, um, if it remains determined to have a smaller public sector than virtually everyone else in, in the world that it likes to compare itself to. You're taking on, and you've done it many times throughout your career, um, decades of economic orthodoxy. Yeah. Um, most people here will never have heard such heresy um, that, that the public sector kind of isn't big enough. We read about it every day in the, in the Korea Mail, don't we? Um, so, you know, they, all they've ever heard about, as you say, is this. You know, can you tell us about the inevitability of a larger public sector and, and reflect on why you argue we need to break with this stultifying orthodoxy and, and do something different? Yeah, well, look, the big picture, if you're going to tell a lie, tell a big one. So we've been told for decades that we have to make the public sector smaller. Have to. Not I'd like to. Not I think we should. Have to. Have to cut taxes. Have to cut spending. Have to privatise. Have to deregulate. And if we don't do that, we'll fall behind. Making Australians feel insecure is so easy. Well, not you, all the other Australians, right? <laughs> Just tell them we'll fall behind in whatever. Who knows on what, right? But we'll fall behind. So we've been told for decades that if we don't cut spending and we don't cut services and we don't cut taxes, you know, we'll never be able to compete with China. It's like, all right, has anyone here heard of Europe? Because <laughs> it exists, right? It's a place. I've been there. And, and there's places in Europe, places I've been, like Norway or Sweden or Denmark or Finland that collect a lot more tax than us, spend a lot more money on services than us, are richer than us, 
Their economies have grown faster than ours. Their productivity has grown faster than ours. And they're happier than us. But you're not allowed to talk about it. Oh, you're just citing this Nordic case. Yeah, it's called data. <laughs> so, so in Australia, we've just been told for decades that we have no choice. And ironically, of course, economics is about choice. I'm a libertarian. I don't want to tell you how to live your life. The job of economics is supposed to say, here are the options you face. Here are the costs. Here are the trade-offs. What do you want? You know, do you want a hundred bucks a bottle of wine or a ten buck bottle of wine? Economists will never tell you how much to spend on wine. We think you're best able to choose. So you decide how much to spend on wine. You decide how much to spend on coffee. You decide how much to spend on a car. But don't for a minute tell me you want a good public health system because that's wrong. That is wrong right there. You can waste as much money as you want on an enormous car, an enormous house. You can spend five bucks a a coffee when you can make it yourself for free and an economist does not care a jot. But say you want to have world-class public health and I will slap you down because that'll make us uncompetitive. Except it won't because has anyone heard of Volvo or Ikea? Right? It's not like Sweden doesn't exist. Right? Germany, high tax, high wages, go to China, you'll find BMWs and Mercedes. So no one else in the world believes this stuff. No one else. The last US president to deliver a budget surplus was, was Bill Clinton. The last UK prime minister to deliver a surplus was Tony Blair. No one cares. But here we are in insecure Australia, terrified that if we don't cut spending on aged care, quick, we'll lose some imaginary competition with China or, or some other Asian country that someone wants to compare us to. So we're always allowed to compare ourselves to low-tax, low-wage countries. That's fine. But anyone that says maybe we should compare ourselves to the richest, happiest, most prosperous people in the world, utopia. <laughs> utopia. So you make the case, I think, you know, persuasively about, you know, the pandemic as really shining a light on these accumulated deficiencies in, in this model and, yep. and how it's delivered and, and maybe that being an opportunity. On the left and right of politics, um, you know, all the stimulus packages and recovery packages are actually premised now, aren't they, on a, an active, uh, a more active and smarter role for governments in the economy. Investments in things the Nordic countries have been doing for a long time, early childhood, education and care in public infrastructure, in addressing inequality as an economic strategy. That's not, you know, that's not the Australia Institute, that's that's the OECD and lots of other, um, you know, previously conservative groups. Um, are you optimistic that we can that we can transcend this ideas regime that has been so persistent for so long? And I mean, I would, I think people would be interested to know why you think it's been so entrenched and so hard to shift. Yeah. Um, look, I'm, opti I'm clearly I'm optimistic that we can. That's different from being optimistic that we will. So sorry to split hairs. Of course we can overthrow this ridiculous idea because let's be clear, no one else in the world believes it. I know that's crazy to hear, right, but no one else in the world shares these obsessions. They did for a while in New Zealand. They did for a while. Can anyone name all the prime ministers since, since Thatcher in the UK? Right, there's been a few. That's how long ago they kind of took this stuff seriously over there. But here we are in Australia still keeping it real. Um, so I'm optimistic that we can overthrow it. Whether we will or not, that's a democratic question. And that's really kind yeah, of the I point agree. of the book is to say, look, it's not my job to tell you that it probably makes more sense to have a health system that looks like Sweden's rather than the US. That's a democratic choice. It's up to us. We can pick it. And if most of us want the American model, we can have it. You know, there's nothing in the Constitution says we have to be nice. There's nothing in the Constitution say we need evidence-based policy. There's nothing in the Constitution mentions corruption, by the way. No, it's, it's silent on it, right? So when we say we must, we have to, we're not having a bar of it. We can. We might. You know, at, at most, I'll say we should, but that's me putting my citizen hat on. So if we want to do this stuff, we can. But our allies don't care if we do. Our foes don't care if we do. And that's really the irony now that, you know, we have so broken our cultural, economic and social institutions 
that we've actually been weakened. Now that's that's happened for the US. The US can't kind of wage its outraged its foreign policy anymore because people are so broken, pissed off at home. Maybe this is good, right? Because they can't just stride boldly around the world declaring war on anyone they want because now there's so many angry people at home. So if we want to kind of be cohesive and be rich and sustain our democracy, we're going to need to put some effort into it. And there's a long literature on this. I mean, post-World War II, the only reason America got so nice to the working class was it didn't want them to be communists. Yes. Right. Republicans and Democrats in the US figured out if we keep treating the working class as nasty as we have, they might kind of think there's an alternative. So all of a sudden the welfare state comes along, massive investment in housing and infrastructure. They knew they better be start being nice to people or the people might start demanding something. And we've been nasty for so long, but well, well, I think we've forgotten really, we can be. This is a really important theme of the essay and so intriguing in, in the choices that we do make uh, within this framework and within this economic orthodoxy and the role that shame plays in public policy. Can you, um, people mightn't have had a chance to read the book yet, but can you just talk a bit to, to this role of, of shame and some of the, this dualism in, in the choices that yeah, are made? Yeah, but, but first, if you haven't read, just leave now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, um, you were last. They got the here first. It's short, I tell you, it's short. Um, uh, look, I think shame plays a terribly important, which doesn't mean good, role in not just Australian public debate, but Australian policy formulation. And, and I think the clearest example that I use in the essay is this. Um, we in Australia, rightly, provide all sorts of services to our veterans, our return, our return soldiers, whether that's, uh, whether that's financial support or health care. Good. Nothing I'm saying is in any way critical of that. But we are so aware that Centrelink is designed to embarrass and shame people that we've set up a parallel welfare system called the Department of Veterans Affairs. Because no one wants to send a veteran who should be proud into Centrelink where we'll make them feel ashamed. Like administratively, this is ridiculous. There is no reason that the people who work at Centrelink that can figure out to, you know, we can rank the shame of age pension to disability to unemployed. We know how to allocate the appropriate amount of shame at Centrelink. We could have a slightly less shameful thing called veteran, but we don't want to make them feel at all ashamed. So we've duplicated the entire administrative artifice of the nation state purely to keep the veterans away from the people we want to shame. Well, that's the purpose of it. And let's look ourselves in the mirror and own that. And, and I quote Menzies in the book. Menzies said, you know, we should never make yeah. people feel ashamed for getting what they're entitled to. People should be no more ashamed. According to Menzies, people should be no more ashamed to draw on a government benefit than they are to claim on an insurance policy to which they're entitled. That's Menzies. Mm. That's how we've changed Australia. So, and think about public housing. We've so debased public housing. We've so diminished it. We've made it so small. We've made it so competitive to get in. But to get in, you have to prove you're the most shameful person around. I've, I've got 10 crosses against my name. Please don't make me be homeless. But we've got the Def Department of uh, the Defence Housing Authority. And you know what the Defence Housing Authority is? It's public housing for soldiers. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. It's branded different. We'll treat you different. It's hard being a soldier. We move you around from city to city. We don't want you to have a problem finding a house when you move to city for city. So we'll build a house. It's as if Australia knows how to build a house. And we'll rent it to you. It's as if our nation state is capable of this task. But if you're a nurse, you're not eligible, or if you're a teacher, you're not eligible, or if you're a police person, you're not eligible, or if you're unemployed, you're not eligible, but you're a soldier, come over here. I've built you a nice four-bedroom house in a nice suburb. And you know what? Defence housing makes a profit, right? So we know how 
to make people feel proud and we know how to make people feel ashamed and we have aimed shame at every, at even the age pension mm. as the from pension. Yes. self-funded retirees. Yeah. And let me just choose my words here, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if there's any self-funded retirees in here. I'll be one of them one day. I get thousands of dollars a year in tax concessions that help boost my super. And by the time I retire, I will have received far more in tax concessions on my super than someone who retires on the age pension ever will. But I get to call myself, and I promise I never will, a self-funded retiree while we kind of suck air over our teeth and talk about the age pensioners who probably should have made some better decisions. I don't hate them, but, you know, they, they made that mistake of going into aged care and helping other people. What were they thinking? How were they going to so be wealthy in their this, retirement? I think pretty persuasively at different points across lots of different examples through the books about the choices and trade-offs that are made that are utterly inconsistent with, you know. With the stated objectives. With the stated objectives, but also with good economic policy. So why is it so resilient? Because we're not trying to do good economic policy. Like, hear me, we're not. That's the excuse for being nasty. But if, and it's a giant if, if we were going to do good economic policy, then right now, today, mm -hmm. rather than spend $15 billion a year on the Stage 3 tax cards, which will deliver $9,000 a year in tax cuts to people earning over 180 grand. If, and it's a giant if, and I don't believe it for a second, if we cared about good economic policy, we would be rolling out free childcare and making it a hell of a lot easier for young parents, brackets, most of whom are women, to re enter the labor market. And that idea is quite mainstream, right? An it's increasing number of mainstream. people are articulating that. But guess still... what? Powerful people who've got enormous constitutional power to allocate money however they want, want to give it to their friends. Is anyone surprised by this? Like, this is the irony. On the one hand, we're like, oh, we're all corrupt. And they're like, oh, they're not actually doing good economic policy. That's right. <laughs> they're not. Right, so the, the evidence is crystal clear. There's not an economist in Australia who's not paid to think otherwise would put their hand on their heart and say, if you had a choice between spending money on tax cuts for high-income blokes or spending money on free childcare, there's not an economist in the country that would argue the tax cuts would deliver more economic growth than the childcare. Right? And we're not going to do it because they don't want to do it. And that's the beautiful thing. I mean, here's the irony in all this. What this is proof of is who we vote for matters. Yeah. <laughs> who we elect matters. Because if managing the economy was some purely technocratic exercise that was purely based on objective economic data, then it wouldn't matter who you elected. So we've kind of been sold this myth that it doesn't matter who you elect, and then that myth has been used to shovel enormous amounts of money onto some groups while making other groups feel embarrassed and ashamed. And again, Sweden doesn't, and Norway doesn't, and Germany doesn't. And these are not backwaters. These are richer, more prosperous, happier countries than our own. So early in the book, you make a really important observation, which is that, you know, illustrated through much of what you said, which is that our democratic debate has become come uncoupled from the real challenges that we face. And this is one of these comments that you'll enjoy as you read the book. In Australia today, our Prime Minister and his Cabinet spend more time picking small fights than solving large problems. Despite the enormity of the challenges this country faces from climate change and defence to housing affordability and domestic violence, discussions revolve around slogans, not solutions. Sound familiar? So you issue a really strong call to action in this book, and there's plenty of economics in it too, um, but you issue a really strong call to action for people to understand and really think about.
getting themselves back in the game? Because one of the things you haven't talked about yet is that the game is locked up for people to be part of the deliberative process. Um, so what's your advice to people who want to reclaim their, their right to become engaged in the critical debates that we need to have, Richard? What do they need to what do they need to do to become engaged about in the problems we want to solve, the services we want and, and are prepared to pay for? Because you talk quite a bit about revenue raising and about the size and shape of government. Um, yeah, look, there's no right answer to how we need to be engaged, but put simply, it's so obvious, we need to be engaged. And, and our debate for decades has told us there's no point to be engaged. Like, what's the point in us sitting around talking about how best would we invest in aged care to improve the quality of services, brackets, as recommended by the Royal Commission? How best would we improve childcare uh, in Australia to not just boost women's participation, but improve educational outcomes as suggested by the OECD. What would be the point in us sitting around having interesting conversations about how to improve things when we all know we have to cut spending? Right? It's just a waste of time. It's fantasy football. So by telling us that we have to cut taxes and we have to cut spending, We've actually just told everybody, shut up, butt out. Don't you understand? We're in a crisis and we're trying to solve the spending crisis. And here's you, you know, soft-hearted, lily-livered, good, I don't know, what virtue signalling, like whatever. I'm trying to save Australia from the burden of tax and, and all of this public spending which is just crap, right? There is, and, and, of course, we've just seen the clearest proof of this. I didn't, sorry, answer the second part of your question before. All of Josh Frydenberg's political life, all of Scott Morrison's political life, all of Tony Abbott's political life, they've argued that the one thing we had to do was deliver a budget surplus. And then they accidentally spent $200 billion on a deficit and they went, fine. <laughs> And they're right. They were just wrong their whole life. <laughs> Do you know what happened to Australia's AAA credit rating after they had an unexpected $200 billion deficit? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Which is about right because it's irrelevant. Right? So their whole political life was being spent trying to slay this imaginary beast. You know, here's me. I'm, I'm out there every day defending you from the threat of debt or something. Did you just double the debt? Yeah. You worried? No. You know how unworried they are? $15 billion a year in tax cuts worth of unworried. Right? They don't, they're taking the piss. <laughs> but they're doing it very persuasively and very having a lot of support uh, to do it. Because well, lots, of, lots of Australians have, have imbibed this yep. belief that it's like managing a household budget. How many people are, are told by friends and family that it's balancing the budget is really important because just like a household budget. No household balances their budget. Let me bust me. <laughs> okay. Does anyone here ever have, has anyone here had a child? <laughs> Did anyone here's child go to university and pay heaps? How reckless. <laughs> you mean you'll, you let your kids live beyond their means? What is a hex debt? Every 18-year-old rocking up at uni is spending more than they're earning. Every 18-year-old rocking up at publicly funded universities is leaving with forty dollars to $80,000 worth of burden from recklessly spending more than they earn, living beyond their means. They've run a budget deficit every year they were at uni and we tell them to, and it's the government lending them the effing money. <laughs> Anyone that earns a hundred grand a year who buys a million dollar house just ran a $900,000 deficit. Has anyone here ever borrowed money to buy a house? <laughs> Reckless. <laughs> Now, human, so, so this idea that households balance is bullshit. It's not how households work. We know that it's okay to borrow money for good things that deliver benefits in the future. 
We know this because we tell our kids it's okay to rack up 60 grand in hex. Right? Some of you might have even lent money to your kids so they can borrow half a million bucks to buy a unit. That's how households manage. And you know what? Households don't borrow forever. Yes, I know. I know the difference. But most people want to repay their debts before they retire. Isn't that nice? When's Australia planning on retiring? <laughs> no, think about it. What's the date that we should have repay our debt by? Is, it, was it 2012? Was it 2013? Is it 2022? Is it 2030? We've got a rapidly growing economy. The same people that want to pay off the debt want to bring in a quarter of a million people a year to grow it. Why do we need to repay all our debt by some arbitrary date? And the answer is we don't. But if I don't want to it's spend... Legis it's legislated the cap on, on how much public spending there should be. And I think this is what's so interesting about the essay, the, the way you kind of show how these ideas have become so yeah. entrenched and how arbitrary they are, They're just arbitrary. how increasingly out of line they are with international practice, including in countries that might have once, um, you know, themselves subscribed to these views in the UK and the US. This is all Briefly, things just for a little while. So, look, I'm not saying debt doesn't matter. I'm not saying we can spend as much as we want on anything we want for as long as we want. But you're right. Everyone thinks you can't run a household that way. You can in Australia. We're the most indebted households in the country. No. That's in the world. Yeah. But we're running around lecturing governments. You can't run a government the way we run our household. Well, you bet you can. No problem at all. Let me throw it open for questions because I'm sure people have been sitting here very politely uh, <laughs> for a long time. Let me throw it open uh, for questions for Richard. We've got one from Zoom to kick it all off, I think. Awesome. A question from Jonty. Um, Richard, if you were treasurer delivering a budget next month, what three things would you fund and what three things would you cut? <laughs> Jonty, that is an unbelievably good question. Yeah. That's pretty coherent, isn't it? Um, <laughs> look, so, so let's be crystal clear here. I, I'm going to give you my answer. This is Richard Dennis, one of 25 million citizens' answer. My key point to you is economists are not trained, able and have no track record of being able to tell you what you should want. These are democratic questions. So I'll tell you my personal answers, no problem at all. But it's actually, this is what democracy is about. What do we want more of? What do we want less of? What are we willing to go without? How should we organise ourselves? Um, well, I'd, I, you know, I'd start with the Aged Care Royal Commission. That, you know, it was the coalition that commissioned it. We spent 50 million bucks having the Royal Commission. It gave us lots of recommendations about how to stop people dying of malnutrition in our aged care homes. Mm. Well, let's not look away from it. That's what's happening. Yeah. Untreated bed sores, malnutrition, terrible, terrible. And, and one of the things that the Royal Commission tells us is that, uh, that the government-run and not-for-profit-run centres don't kill as many people as the for-profit centres. And they're cheaper. They kill less people, they hurt less people, and they're cheaper. There might be a pattern here worth exploring. But the first thing I'd do would be to implement those uh, recommendations from the Aged Care Royal Commission. Um, the second thing I'd do is spend a hell of a lot more money on childcare. You'll see a pattern here, the caring parts of our economy. They don't just help us directly. Uh, when we employ good people and we pay them good wages, it's a great way to, quote, stimulate the economy. You want to pump money into the economy? Give a nurse a pay rise. But the idea that the only way to stimulate the economy is to give rich blokes a tax cut, odd. <laughs> Not in any economics textbook. And yet oddly pervasive. Oddly, yeah. pervasive. oddly pervasive in the treasuries of this country. It's like a whole bunch of rich blokes got together and figured out a nice, <laughs> simple strategy for giving themselves a tax cut. But also look bewildered when you challenge them on it. Well, they rarely are, or they'll patronise you more than engage with you. So, so, yeah, so the child care sector uh, needs a lot of money. The aged care sector needs a lot of money. And, you know, the science is quite clear when it comes to climate change. We don't have a lot of time. So they would be my three spending priorities. And let's be crystal clear, all of those things will deliver long-term benefits. <laughs> okay? They will save us money in the long run. Uh, they will make people happy and healthier. And it's a great way to stimulate the economy because low-paid aged care workers and childcare workers, I promise you, will spend every cent in pay rides that we give them. Revenue, oh, that's really easy. And just to be clear, we don't have to balance the budget every year. Your kids don't, anyone that bought a house don't, Australian government doesn't have to. But if we want to have a much bigger public sector, we do need to collect more tax over time. 
They don't have to exactly equal every year. That's just technocratic sophistry. But the, the, the countries with the biggest public sectors also collect a lot more tax. That's not a surprise. Um, uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give people earning over 180,000 bucks a $9,000 a year tax cut. That's what we've legislated. That's the stage three tax cuts. They come in in 2024, they'll cost $15 billion a year in 2024. By 2030, they'll cost $30 billion a year. You know what our total Commonwealth spending on aged care is? About $22 billion. Can't afford to implement the Royal Commission inquiry uh, findings. No, no, very expensive. Don't you understand? Money doesn't grow on trees, Richard. Where's the 15 bill for the income tax cuts come from? Oh, we think the economy will grow, fund itself over time. Right, when they want to spend money, it's fine. When you want to spend money, it's reckless. So I'd scrap the stage three tax cuts in a heartbeat. At the moment, we spend around $10 billion a year subsidising the fossil fuel industry. Not taxing it, subsidising it. So I'd scrap the fossil fuel subsidies tomorrow, $10 billion a year, enormous amount of money. Uh, and like every economist in the world, I'd stick a carbon price on. Because you know what? The reason we tax cigarettes and alcohol is we want to discourage their use. It's not rocket science. When Tony Abbott was health minister, he jacked up the price of cigarettes. Why? Because he was trying to discourage people from smoking. When discourage people from polluting, stick a tax on it. You want to compensate low-income earners? Shovel them some cash. They're separate. The questions for Richard. Up the back, please. Jack, Richard, um, just to change the subject a little bit, I don't get from China. I just don't understand how we've done this, this you know, economically. It's our biggest income earner, one of our biggest income earners, and uh, we're talking war and we're talking all sorts of things. So just for the Zoom audience, there's a question about the China relationship and the increasing antagonism from the government being expressed towards the Chinese, given the risks around trade and um, and, and revenue. Yeah, oh, look, unfortunately, a couple of answers all a bit cynical, but I, I believe all of them. Uh, racism works in Australia. Uh, works a treat. Um, it's, it worked for Pauline Hanson. Uh, it worked for John Howard with the Tampa. Uh, racism has, a, and, and of course, a, a longer, more shameful past than that. So on the one hand, just step one, racism works. Um, fear works, right? You know, and that's, I've told, like, you know, for 30 years, I've been told to be afraid of the public sector, be afraid of the debt. If you can make everyone feel nervous, then it's a lot easier to get them to go along with things they don't really like. So racism works in Australia. Fear works in Australia. Both of those things are true. Um, but, you know, I, make, I really enjoyed writing the essay. It's how I kind of get my head into gear and I learn a lot when I'm writing these things. And the most interesting thing I learned when I was writing it was that Australia spends more on defence than Taiwan. We've got 25 million people. They've got 23 million, a little bit smaller. Taiwan's 200 miles from mainland China. China makes overt territorial claims to Taiwan. We spend more money defending Australia than Taiwan. And according to surveys done by the Australia Institute and others, we're more worried about invasion than people in Taiwan. Australia has an enormous... We are, I had, you know, yeah, yeah. you can't taste the... Fish can't taste the water it swims in. We are a militarised society. We spend more money on defence than all of our neighbours combined. Right, add up all of our territorial neighbours' defence budgets, go a fair way up beyond our neighbours into Southeast Asia, add them all up and we spend more than all of them combined and we feel afraid. It's a, it's a rich vein, that one, and um, Julianne Schultz's book, The Idea of Australia, which will be published next month, I think, Christine. Yeah, we've got an event with her. Um, and, and there is an event, yeah, towards yeah. the end of March. She really deals with this deep vein of fear and anxiety and how how able to be activated it always has been. Um, it's fascinating, so, so you're spot on. So we better brace for fear, hadn't we, yep. and scary things between now and the 7th, 14th or 21st of May. Another thing, I, I, I learned this, but I couldn't squeeze it into the essay, but I, I think it fits. I mean, so Australia is, we've debased so many of our institutions, including the public service. Mm. 
you know, the idea of frank and fearless public service advice is in the federal bureaucracy, I'll suggest quaint and anachronistic. One of the reasons is that federal public servants in Australia are now not just amongst the highest paid people in Australia, very, very high salaries. Uh, we have the highest paid public service, I'll say, in the developed world. So the head of the army in Australia, what do you reckon head of army or head of, uh, like the, 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 not the head of the Defence Force, you know, the general with the most stars on the shoulder? Have a guess what they earn a year. Two mil. Sorry? Two mil. Two mil, one mil. Oh, my God. million bucks a year. Well, the post office man can get five. Well, not the well, it's interesting you say that because the head of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, who is in charge of the largest military in the world, 400,000. <laughs> but this is not all of our public servants are now so well paid the senior ones, right? Nurses, please more. Aged care, please more. Child care, please more. Mid-level policy officers, maybe more. I don't really know. I haven't, it's not my bugbear. No, I just don't have a strong view. But I'm saying I'm very happy with public sector pay rises. But let's be clear, in the Commonwealth Public Service, there's a lot of people earning $800, $900 million, $20,000 a week to give frank and fearless advice. It is not very frank. <laughs> and it is not very fair. And, that, and that's provoked a few questions, I think. So the gentleman in the middle, and then uh, I, then I'll come to the lady. A couple of comments before the question. Uh, one, you say about the happiness index in the minority countries. Finland's got one of the highest out uh, public rates in the world, I gather, worse than Australia. That's a question mark over that. And I'll jump with the thing. They're very happy about something. Uh, <laughs> very, very, very friendly. But two, Free childcare worries me. Things you get for free, you don't pay. There should be some fee, not terribly costly, recovery, whatever. But the ultimate question is basically the ultimate person that's, that's caused this problem is us. Where are we as a going on? So, just to paraphrase for the people on Zoom, a couple of comments um, that I won't paraphrase, and a question about um, where we've gone wrong as a community in allowing the priorities. Oh, there, there was a point about the things we don't pay for, we don't value. Um, so that's kind of interesting for you to respond to, Richard. But then the second dimension is where, where have we gone wrong in these kinds of priorities? Having had that voting count for one of the parties, the average citizen. Off by yeah, yeah, yeah. The average and the argument being the average citizen is completely turned off by voting. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah. I I used to share a house with a Finnish woman, great friend of mine, Morose. Uh. And boy, they <laughs> like a drink. Uh. There's no doubt. I don't. I don't think Australia should be Norway. I don't think Australia should be Finland. I think we should be Australia. My point is that when we're told that unless we cut taxes and unless we have a smaller public sector, we'll go, we'll be ruined, is factually demonstrably untrue. Well, it also flies in the face of our public policy tradition that was not that. No, it, wasn't, it wasn't that for a long time. It's not that in most countries. So I'm not saying there's no problems in Finland, there's no problems in Norway. They've got problems. I don't want to be them, but they're clear proof that everything we've been told that we have to have a smaller public sector is demonstrably untrue. Well, having a, a bigger public sector in Australia and paying aged care workers more fixed endemic racism in Australia, no. Right? We'll still have problems after we've got a bigger public sector, right? but I'd rather have a bigger public sector and, and be trying to solve those problems than have a smaller public sector and try and solve those problems. So that's my first point. I'm not saying we should ape or copy or, or aspire to be some other country. I just think we should draw the lessons from a broader range of countries. In terms of, uh, in terms of our kind of democracy and voters not caring, well, why should they care? This is my point. Like we've been told for so long that the only thing to care about is the ASX and if we cut company taxes enough, some foreign investor will come and we'll all get a job and we'll all be rich. Like we've kind of abandoned agency, right? It's, it, when I say that we as a nation state should be proud and independent and set our own rules the way we want them, I, I'm being utopian, I don't understand. You know, the good thing about, well, there's lots of good things about Finland, but Finland and Norway, 
You know who their neighbour is, their friendly neighbour? Russia. Russia. <laughs> but they're not sucking up to America for their foreign policy. They're not spending as much on defence as we are. Or they actually think that the best defence for their nation is to not be crap. <laughs> right? So, so here we are, cowering, cowering in Australia that, that China, which is 6,000 kilometres away and has no blue water navy, right? Yeah, and think of all the countries that have to invade before they got here. Right, and here's us going, oh, $90 billion subs. I'm afraid they won't be good enough. <laughs> Let's get some more expensive ones. How much will they cost, Scott? Doesn't matter. Whatever it takes. Can't skimp when it comes to nuclear submarines. What about aged care? Stuff them. Yeah. Right, so, so I, I, I don't get me wrong. Yes, we have agency as individuals. But if our democracy is going to work, then we actually all have to believe that the project we're a part of is a worthwhile project. Sorry, it's a long answer. But imagine I was saying, I want to be president of the local surf club. Why? Because I hate it. <laughs> I think we should shut it down. Who needs surf clubs? Vote for me. Put me in charge. I'll get rid of this thing and I'll sell the real estate. <laughs> But that's how you become Prime Minister in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you want to be Prime Minister of Australia? Hide it. I want to be in charge of getting rid of everything that we do and we're going to do less of it and I'm just going to leave it all to you. And we're just going to let people get on with their lives. Let, I'm going to get out of your way. want to get on with their lives. Well, right. So, so true. They do. But there's a question here and then there's one there. And then I'm going to paraphrase them for the Zoom audience. I'll, I'll so try and answer quick, more. Sure. Be quick. Okay, Richard, I'm very interested in your thoughts on a universal basic income, particularly coming back to that idea of shame. If we just went across the board, this is the baseline. So yep. lift and eliminate shame. Interested in your ideas. Um, so I have complicated thoughts about universal basic income. If I was an academic and I was starting with a white sheet of paper, sign me up. I've got no problem with it all. Can Australia afford one? Yeah. Would it be nice? Yeah. We can't give the bloody unemployed a pay rise. Like we are so nasty and cruel and proud of our cruelty when it comes to, to the poorest people in the country. As, as someone who's interested in policy and politics and democracy, I just kind of can't start with how about we give Richard and an unemployed person a universal payment? Like, I'll take it. Stuff money in my pocket. I'm all yours. Like, I'll have it. But I'm not my priority. So in theory, I've got no problem with it. In economics, I've got no problem with it. And I can, I can see the democratic appeal of it. But as a democratic project, I find it hard to walk past unemployment, to walk past climate change, to walk past aged care and think, I know how I'm going to spend my day and spend the next 20 years trying to get this up, which doesn't mean I'm opposed. Um, and, and, and to give you a, a kind of simple way forward, because I always try to find a, a middle path, like let's go for universal basic income. Let's start by saying, how about we increase the unemployment benefit to the age pension? Right. How, how about we start with universal welfare payments yeah. and let's lift them all up to the level of the age pension. And we even tried it last year and it seemed to make a difference. It, it worked a treat. Oh, and look, I, I had to cut it back. Look, you know, I, I banged my head into a wall for two years <laughs> trying to get people in the welfare sector to say, we look, for the first time ever, we don't have to get sucked into playing age care versus unemployment. Mm -hmm. But can we please just say this works? Can we all have a universal welfare payment? But, of course, the aged pensioners want to have more than the unemployed. Not you, the other aged pensioners, right? So, no, because divide and conquer works on people who aren't you, right? It doesn't work on you, but on everyone else it works a treat. So, so I'd start with, so my point is you can get to a universal basic income kind of one step at a time. And if after we've started to pay the unemployed the same as the age pension and then we've agreed that everyone who's old should get the age pension even if they're Gina Reinhardt, because that's what a universal basic income is, after we've got to that step, if you can then convince everyone to give me 15 grand a year, I'll take it. But I wouldn't start with me.
I'd start with the ones who need it. And, and you make a number of really important points about the Royal Commissions that we've had into these systems as kind of being important priorities. Andrew. Uh, good day. Uh, look, just, just interested, I guess, in your take on events in the past week or two. In particular, I'm interested in, I guess, the way capitalism seems to be driving a lot of our response to climate change rather than, rather than government. Last week, we had the two largest power, coal fired power stations in Australia, and their closure being put forward. Um, and I'm sure you remember the not too distant past, we had the Prime Minister saying, can you capitalism? Mm. We'll get us through. Well, uh, yes, sir, of course, we had another another takeover, which I think Jim will then disagree that that's the open shop that will come back. But they want to close down power stations and put more into renewables. My point here is that the Prime Minister is quite possibly right. Can do capitalism make it safe? Yes. <laughs> but I don't think I don't think he can be like, uh, like that. I just think to your views there on what the way the private sector seems to be driving this a lot more so than um, a lot more so than the public sector. So for our friends at home, uh, the question is about uh, can-do capitalism uh, and the extent to which um, the developments of the last week around AGL and about the bringing forward of the Ararang, um power station are really showing that the that, that markets are moving and that the government is, is sort of increasingly out of step. Yeah, so, you know, being an author, I can't help but plug an old book. Um, so I wrote a quarterly essay called Dead Right, uh, and it was all about, and I wrote it, I don't know, three or four years ago, my argument was that neoliberalism's dead, right? The word exists, some of the ideas exist, but as a policy and political agenda, it's dead because conservatives in Australia love subsidising private schools. They love subsidising private hospitals. They love subsidising coal mines. They just don't want to subsidise renewable energy. They love deregulating banks. They love deregulating aged care, but they love regulating unions. And they love regulating charities. So to call them ideologues, I think, is to flatter them unfairly, right? It's just old-fashioned, punch your enemies, help your friends. So, so that's kind of my big picture. I don't think that the government has ever been philosophically or ideologically committed to market solutions. Otherwise, why are we subsidising coal mines? Why do we need subsidies for gas-led recovery, right? So the Prime Minister's intervention yesterday where uh, private capital in the form of a billionaire and a Canadian pension fund say we'd like to buy AGL and try and green it up a bit, the fact that the Prime Minister wants to red tape nanny state interventionistly step in and say, oh, I don't like the cut of your jib, like I love it when the private sector wants to take over prisons, I don't want the private sector stepping in to shut down a coal-fired power station is exactly what I wrote about in Dead Right. This is why these people seek constitutional power, to wield it, to do what they want, to help their friends and punch their enemies. And so it's not private sector versus public sector. These, this government hates the bits of the private sector that sells electric cars and hates the bits of the private sector that builds wind turbines. It's just friends and enemies. And you've actually, you make a number of really interesting points in here about what's being nationalised. Yeah. In a, you know, so there's no ideological coherence, you know. No, well, so we, are, we are in the great era of nationalisation, right? So all we got all these lefties running around, going, oh, if only we did the nation building that we used to. You've got to shut up? No, no, no. Um, <laughs> we're, we're consulting, you don't. <laughs> um, so, you know, you get all this, oh, what about, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. The right are entirely unconstrained by your anxieties and insecurities about how to fund things. $50 billion national, hint in the name, national broadband network, publicly owned, $50 billion. $20 billion national inland railway line, hint in the name. $8 billion snowy hydro. Right? We are in the era of nationalisation of things they want to build. It's just you want them to build something else. And, and not you, but the person sitting next to you gets stuck thinking there's, oh, how would we fund it? Or, or there's some ideological barrier. That's what we can't afford it. We can't afford it. Barnaby Joyce was once challenged. I quoted this in Dead Right. I remember the quote verbatim. Barnaby Joyce was once challenged on, he was, you know, wanted to build some dam in the middle of nowhere. And at the launch, you know, someone said, there's not even a business case for this. The reason the state government didn't build the dam, it was in Queensland, was there's no business case. And he said, quote, 
you got to ask yourself, are you a fluffer or are you a doer? <laughs> we need to get big yellow things pushing dirt around. That's how you get the country moving. But think about all the NGOs out there writing budget submissions that left out the fluffer, doer, <laughs> dirt, yellow thing, key decision-making point. The point is when they want to spend money on things they like, they do. Submarines, no problem. Tax cuts, no problem. Yellow things pushing dirt around at a place they like, no problem. You want money on aged care, you want money on childcare, you want to spend more on the unemployed. <sighs> money doesn't grow on trees, you know. We've got one more question from our online audience. Oh, no, not we, we don't have. Um, we don't? No, I said we could go to oh, one. Oh, we could go to one more question. Yeah. See, I, I, I was confused. Yeah. Uh, one more. Okay. Oh, no, now. Two <laughs> one. The, the person on my left. Oh, I can't quite see. How do you think that on following on to your point, these arguments have won, and how do you combat them when things like referring to the science and the data doesn't seem to Oh, that's a great question to the people at home. Um, you, you know, how do you argue with people who don't accept facts, science and data, and whether it's on climate or whether it's on the economy? Yeah, or whether it's on vaccines. Um, <laughs> no, it's really like, this, don't argue with idiots, all right? But, you know, there's, a, there's actually a Russian phrase, you know, the useful idiot. The, the, you know, the, no, it's, look it up. It's foreign <laughs> policy. They, Donald Trump was their useful idiot, all right? Just because someone's stupid doesn't mean you can't utilise that. So, you know, we don't need to win arguments with idiots and we certainly can't win arguments with liars. But in a democracy, we don't need to. We need to have persuasive conversations with everybody. And it's never been easy. There was never the good old days. Kerry Packer was not a friendly, progressive media proprietor that just wanted to make our democracy great. Right? And, and he used to wield enormous political power through Channel 9. So, so kind of forget about the good old days and how do we do it. It's always been hard to, to be nice. It's always been hard to take on wealth and power and redistribute resources. But, yeah, I think we have to be very careful to not get caught trying to persuade idiots and liars. We have to persuade our, our fellow citizens and to the extent that we engage with these people who either are genuinely stupid or genuinely insincere, we just need to have a conversation with them that's not designed to persuade them but designed to persuade everyone who's watching that conversation. And that's the key. You know, I guess when I've been in and out of politics for a long time and the most common bit of political advice I give to staffers or even politicians who are struggling is I say, how is being right helping you? <laughs> no, because it's like being right becomes performance art. Yeah. Like, watch me be right at them. <laughs> you know, why? Why do you want to be right at them? Don't you want to persuade a whole bunch of other people to change their mind? So, so we actually have to think, who do we need to persuade? What do they need to hear? And, and look, my most common rhetorical technique is contradiction and hypocrisy. You know, and that's why I'm, I hope, genuinely humble about saying, I don't know what we should do, but if you're the person that says we have to worry about the deficit and you're the person saying you can have $15 billion worth of tax cuts at the moment, I think you've got some explaining to do. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be right to be persuasive. And sure, I can give you all a macroeconomic lecture on Keynesian stimulus, but who cares? Why not get Josh Frydenberg to explain why if the deficit's such a big problem, he can afford tax cuts for his mates, but he can't afford to spend more on aged care. And then shut up. Like, that's the hard part. Stop. But you say, no, you still haven't answered. Right, and, and that takes humility, uh, it takes patience, but also I think it takes strategy because you have to think you're not the person I'm trying to persuade. Right? You're just trying to win office. I, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you now. You, I'm holding you responsible for all of it. Uh, you're just trying to win office and you'll say anything to these people to get them to vote for you. Well, I'm not trying to persuade you. I'm trying to persuade them that you're not taking them seriously. So I, I think that, yeah, being right at people doesn't work generally and it really doesn't work with idiots and liars. Mm.
On page 14 of Big, Richard says, it's hard to believe that anyone who understands how important government decisions are could believe that who is in government doesn't matter. In this book, he issues a big challenge to all of us to think about the problems we want to solve as citizens, the services we want and are prepared to pay for, and the size and shape of government. And you actually say that a bigger public sector is inevitable, whatever happens. Um, can I, on your behalf, thank Richard and congratulate him on his book, Big? Thank you, Richard, uh, for coming to Brisbane. Yeah. To the Zoom audience and uh, good to see you. And uh, for everybody else, Richard will be signing copies of, of B. Yeah. Uh, and you can take up any more questions with him then. Thanks very right. much. Thank you. Me. Thanks, Anne, for doing this conversation. It's really great. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take 